All right, it's a minute after one. I'm assuming everybody that's coming is here already. So. Well, I'm here now, so we can start. Oh, okay. We're waiting on you, DJ. I see how it is. <laughs> Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexander Pearson. Most people call me Z or Commodore Z. Um, if you're here for the cactus, you are in the right place. Um, so uh, that's me. That's how to reach me. It's my website. You can find information about my projects and primarily my big one here, which we're going to be spending a bit. I don't know, 25 minutes on, and then questions, and you guys can interrupt me at any point if you're like, hey, wait a minute, or if you got a question, you know, stop me. I, I, wanna, I wanna hear it. I, I, I wanna discuss this with you. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about my Homebrew 6502 computer here in three parts. Give you some historical context. That's the part I assume plenty of you will uh, already have some bits and pieces of, if not a pretty good picture of what's going on. Um, and if you have something contradicting in your head, Feel free to let me know, because I'm trying to improve my, how, how I'm sharing this history. Uh, after that, the design and build process. And then uh, normally I'd do a front panel demo, but it's been in there. You guys get a chance to you know, do one-on-one -on -one stuff. So I'm, I've kind of reduced that part. But I'm still going to explain a lot of the features and functionality at that point. So I want you all to step it back in time with me to the 1970s. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. I, I don't know what the 70s were like. I'm, I'm a little young for that. Uh, how, many, how many of you uh, are familiar with the 6502 processor in some way, shape, or form? Awesome. It's fantastic. You're in the right place. Uh, now, how many of you have seen one with a front panel, not counting the cactus? OK. That's, uh, that's more than the last time I, I gave this talk. Only, it would, in, only in pictures. Awesome. No, uh, any, any in person? All right, yeah. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. OK. So um, for the rest of you that don't remember the 1970s, me neither, um, what's important? Microprocessors. They're a new thing. They're making everybody's lives easier. 1972, we got that 8008. 74, we got the 8080 and the Motorola 6800. 75, those guys over at MOS Technology say, hey, we're making a thing. It's called the 6501, and, uh, and Motorola is not happy about it. And you know, it's a little too close for comfort to what they're building. So it tweaked a little bit after that lawsuit, and the 6502 is born. And it's, it's lean, it's mean, it's quick. It's, it's missing a lot of the fluff that slowed down the 6800. It's a beautiful processor. Uh, and then after that, 76, we got the RCA 1802. Yay. And, yay. Uh, and the Zilog Z80, same kind of a, a vein, starting with the 8080 and then improving upon it, adding some features, making it cheaper, but making, the, uh, making it accessible. Those last three we mentioned there, the 6502, the 1802, and the Z80, all inexpensive and easy to acquire microprocessors. And that's nice. Uh, that, that means that we don't have to worry about building up our own logic TTL style. We don't have to start with somebody's ALU and build up the rest from scratch. We're given something that will do a lot of heavy lifting for us. This is helpful. Um, but more importantly, a lot of these chips come with support chips. They have logic families and, and parts that come along. Um, so this is, my, uh, this is an 8080A with a pair of 8255s. That's nice. That's going to make our job a lot easier. Same kind of thing happens with, uh, with the 6502. We've got plenty of fun, fun chips that come along with it. Um, just a, uh, my personal favorite, though. Uh, but we don't have to be like this guy right here. This is, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bob Lash, I, wanted, uh, I believe is. Do I have it listed up there? No, I don't. Um, this is his homebrew computer built out of 7400 series logic. We don't have to be as smart and as dedicated as him to create a machine now. We can just get a microprocessor. We can build up the rest of this. Because really, if you want a computer in, in your home, that's the way to do it. Um, now, if we're looking at a couple other approaches to homebrew, uh, but also kit computers and just front panel interfaces really quick here, Ken Back 1 in, uh, in 72, it's got push buttons. It's, uh, it, it, you know, it's still all 7400 series logic, but it's relatively small. It's cheap. It's, it's not too crazy. Obviously, it didn't see super wide re um, uh, release. There's only, what, less than 100 that are in circulation total. And we've got only a few dozen that we can count on right now, if memory serves. 
And we got this guy, the Mark 8. Look at that. Um, this came out the uh, uh, same year as the Selby in uh, 1974. Uh, this one in particular, uh, July uh, issue of Radio Electronics. As far as I'm aware, no Mark 8s look the same because everybody's got their boards, they populate them, they build up the rest of the interface as they need to. So they, none of them match. They're still very um, uh, user intensive to create something that's functional and helpful. And then we get to the big guy in 75, the Altair 8800. Everybody loves this one kit. You know, you show up, you got tiny little amount of RAM, 256 uh, bytes. Is the, that's the default, right? I'm not an Altair guy, but it's got a nice front panel interface. It's big. No push buttons, but it's a massive interface. We've got a lot of lights. We can see what's going on in our address space, our data space. Um, and then we got the other approach here in 75, Southwest Technical Products with their 6800. Hey, wait a minute. Where's that front panel? means we're relying on something else to talk to it, like a terminal. Then we got the, 60, uh, the 680, Altair's answer to Southwest, Southwest Technical Products uh, device. And, and here's the thing. Sure, it's using the same Motorola 6, uh, 6800, but it's kind of bare bones compared to the 8800. Where, where's the, where are all the other switches? You're doing front panel DMA, but... Um, well, you can't do any complex examines or examine next. So, you know, you're very limited. There's no sense switches for software to find input. OK. A lot of people don't like the way this is designed. They say it's, it's very bare bones. It's kind of rushed. It's, it's missing a lot of features that they want. And um, it's got some interesting technical flaws. Uh, I recommend talking to Systems Glitch if you're curious, because he's into that right now. Then our 1802 fans. We've got that elf. Look at that. You, you, uh, you had your, uh, your copy of uh, August Popular Electronics from 1976. You can build a cheap machine. Was it $99 was, was the threshold to make one of these things? $80? Ooh, all right. Point is, it's got a very simple front panel DMA interface. It's, you know, it's a tiny amount of switches, but you're still able to do a lot. And somebody can just build this, and that's awesome. It's you, the processor, not too much else. And then a couple of Steves from uh, California come up with this thing. Hey, look, we're finally seeing the 6502, but uh, man, this thing's expensive, $666. Are, are you serious? OK. But uh, again, no front panel. Where is it? Where's, where's the, the interaction? Well, we're relying on something more complicated to talk to this machine and enter in programs and whatnot. Uh, and then going into just other front panels, um, just because I like looking at these. Um, just the, the functions, the features that are all kind of common on them. You know, everybody loves the PDP-8, especially the E, just because it's relatively easy to get compared to the other ones. But it's got a pretty clear setup of, of how you're doing your front panel DMA, your, your switches, address, uh, being able to start and uh, step, and all that good stuff. It's, it, it's very full featured. And then the bigger brother, we're getting to Unix territory now. PDP-1170. Again, same kind of, a, of an approach, but way more switches. OK, this is pretty cool. I want to see what this is all about. And, uh, and there's a bugging question that's getting to, my, uh, to me, but we'll get to that in a second. And then you see what uh, HP was doing, HP 1000. It's got push buttons, and that's interesting. Um, and then down at the bottom, you switch between what register or what value you're looking at and so that you can reuse that same set of LEDs and switches over and over again. That's efficient. That's pretty cool. Um, and then this is one of my favorites, just because of how influential it is. Data General's Nova. Um, this right here, two major forks. Number one, you see it influ influence the, the way that the layout and the, the user experience is for the Altair 8800. But at the same time, it shows uh, Steve Wozniak, hey, we can do less with more. Because this is, to my knowledge, a, a relatively uh, close uh, design in terms of what it can do to a, to a PDP-8, but it's doing it in less chips by optimizing based on what 7400 series logic is available, right? It's, it's, it's making more out of less. Good lessons, but also a really cool layout. I love this. Then we get to the mother of all front panels, just because I like to list this one. Um, this is from uh, an IBM System 360 Model 91, I want to say. 91 sounds about right. 
I don't think I've seen one bigger so far, but man, you want to do some serious front panel DMA, you, you can do it here, but apparently you don't want to. Apparently it's just for debugging purposes and most folks didn't even bother with that. Still, front panel, that's pretty cool. We've got a way to view our contents of memory with all of these previous examples. We have a way to modify those contents in memory. We can start and stop processing. And these are all what we need from front panel DMA. But then we have some extras that we might want, like software addressable I.O. if we want to play kill the bit for the Altair and MSI fans out there. Uh, we got hopefully have a way to single step the clock or the instruction, you know, one or the other. Um, they're not the same. I learned that the hard way. Um, sometimes we can protect memory. But if you're really lucky, and you can afford something more, more uh, powerful than that for the homebrew, side of, uh, homebrew kit side of things, you can get yourself an ASR33. You've got a teletype. Now you've got stuff in human readable text. All right. Paper tape. You've got storage, too. That's nice. And if you're really extra, you've got the money to pay for a full glass terminal. You can see what's going on in real time. You don't have to wait for the printer to go. And, but you've got to have some money. Keep in mind, we're still in the mid-70s here. Um, and yes, these did get cheaper as time goes on. But if you're doing something homebrew from the ground up, this would have been kind of out of your price range. And then 77 hits, and the world changes. Those guys from Cupertino and uh, what was it? What's the other part of I don't know. What's the name of the city that the, the Apple boys are from? Point is, they come out with a revised version of the Apple, the Apple II. It's pretty nice. It does a lot of stuff. It's got video output. It's all self-contained. It even does color if you know what you're doing. Commodore, they're finally on the scene with their Pet 2001. It's got a chiclet keyboard, which is interesting, but it does graphics, sort of. It's Pet's key. It's graphics. It's got tape built in. It's got monitor built in. All right. Then if you're like most folks uh, up until about 1980, you sprung for the TRS-80 Model 1 because this was the least expensive option out of all of them. You got a Z80 in here. You get a separate little monitor. And as you go, you can expand. And, but you've got yourself a computer. And that's pretty awesome. And what ties these all together? They're appliances. We don't have to be home brewers anymore. We don't have to spend our time making something up from scratch. Keyboards, displays um, for easy user interaction. We got basic in ROM. We don't have to. We don't have to load it. We don't have to use bootloaders to, to get something on there to do any serious work. We just turn a key, or to flip a switch, I should say, ready to go. We've got commercial software finally coming out en masse for all these platforms. Cheap storage, either with cassette, sta uh, cassette tape, or if you've got a floppy drive, if you're really fancy, you, know, you can afford that if you have the use for it. Uh, Memory is cheaper here. That's why we can fit so much in here. We've got uh, options of 4K, 8K. Um, and some of them go up to, to 48K, uh, I believe, on the Apple II. I'm, I'm not an Apple guy. Um, but they're all under two grand, and that's nice. Accessibility is through the roof. Just about anybody can get this. And this means that the front panel is dead. Um, nobody wants to do, deal with that anymore. We don't have to. And uh, as I'm going through this, I thought to myself, OK, somebody out there. How, how come there's no front panels with a 6502? We've seen this with the other processors, the Z80, the 8080, the 8008, the 1802. Something's not right here. I mean, even the 6800 had one. What's going on? Somebody says to me, that's because the 6502 was late enough that folks used the serial link to a terminal. The Apple One had that built in. Quite the step forward from a front panel with switches and lights, or folks use the 6502 with the 6530 with the TIM monitor and ROM to a serial terminal. I'm going to call BS here. Came out in 70, uh, the 75. Somebody in an era before you, you could have easily acquired uh, a terminal or, or a teletype for cheap had to have thought to themselves, no, nah, no, nah, let's use a front panel. It's, it's, it's a cheap processor. It's a cheap interface compared to its competitors prior to 77. There's got to be a reason for this. What is it? I don't know. Uh, so what were people doing with the 6502 instead? Well, we got Synertech's answer here with the SIM1. Uh, it's got a hexadecimal keypad, hexadecimal output display. It's actually pretty fully featured. You can do a lot with this. Um, it's got a little bit of ROM. It's got a lot of I.O., expandability. It's, it's capable. Hey, 
that's a front panel. That's a 6502. This is the OSI 300. Ohio Scientific said, let's make a little tiny cheap $99 trainer. You with 128 bytes of, of RAM, some switches, LEDs, that's it. You're set. You can do some data entry and you can learn the instruction set for the 6502. Nothing too complicated. You're not, uh, you're not capable of doing any serious I.O. You get like one little TTL latched output on a high address that isn't touched by RAM. That's it. That's all you get. No expandability. And you've got to load in your programs every single time. There's no, there's no permanent storage for this. That's frustrating. Meanwhile, Commodore, or rather MOS, and then later Commodore, has their, uh, their Kim 1. Uh, again, hexadecimal keypad, display, expandability, a little simpler than that SIM one, but still plenty powerful. And this is what most people think of when they think of a minimalist 6502 machine. This is what comes to mind for a lot of folks. Now, what is this? If you had yourself a SIM one, you could get yourself this rare little uh, add-on by CGRS Microtech. It bolts onto your SIM one, and it gives you a software-defined front panel. It's it's running software to operate this correctly. It's 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 a separate device. It doesn't let you do true DMA into into what's on board, but it's a good start. You know, okay. I only learned about this, by the way, within the last uh, three or four months. So this wasn't on my radar um, when starting this project, but we'll get to that in a second. Then there's this weird thing. I only found out about this within the last uh, three months as well. November 1977, an issue of Byte Magazine. Somebody comes up with this homebrew design known as the Computar, spelled with a K and two U's. What are we looking at here? It's got address lights. It's got a, a hexadecimal display for data. It's got some interesting switches there to see the data bus, the accumulator, X and Y registers, stack pointer. It's doing a lot in here. And I look through the schematics and I discover this is a rat's nest. I have no idea what they were thinking. I want to understand the, the philosophy behind this, but I can't find any record of anybody building one, and who knows what happened to the original. But apparently it was good enough to get into Byte Magazine with full schematics and build stuff, so I'm sure somebody could reproduce it. Um, don't look to me. <laughs> uh, now, let's go back to that OSI 300 real quick. What it's doing is it's letting you talk directly to the RAM and enter in some stuff with these buffers here to protect these switches and LEDs at the right times. And it's, it's some interesting juggling with some open collector stuff that I, I sort of don't quite understand. But the point is, you are able to enter in some stuff into RAM. Then you tell the CPU, your turn. You run off of this. That's fine. OK. But the, the 6502 is not helping you. So in my travels, I come across this. Grant Cyril has a, a couple of machines, to, uh, these minimal footprint uh, computers based off of the Z80, 6809, and the 6502, doing it in a, just a handful of chips using a serial interface. And the first time I'm looking at this and I go, the chip interactions make sense. What's going on in the bus, the memory layout clicks for me finally. OK, I wonder, hmm. By the way, I totally recommend looking that up. It's, it's a lot of fun. I built one of these things. Um, you can run BASIC on it. You've got OSI BASIC in, in, uh, in a ROM. You're talking over, over a serial link. But that's not too many chips. That's a lot of fun. OK, I, I wonder. Uh, that, that's it running BASIC, by the way, on my uh, H89 acting as an H19 just because I don't have any other terminals. Point is, you're using BASIC. You're using 6502 pretty powerfully. You've got a lot of, a lot of at your fingertips there. So I decided, you know what? I want to combine some of these concepts. I'll make my own machine. And so I start looking around and finding some parts. And next thing I know, I've, I've got a, a crude bus. And people ask me, why is it 35 pins wide? It's because I found a board that had 35 bus strips on it. I said, I bet you I could fit a 6502 bus on there. Turns out, yes uh, and no, as in I already filled it up. And now we're at 40. and. There's still only 35 pins on there, so there's jumper wires. And I start building, instructing, and I think to myself, I want to experience this the way that folks did in the 1970s. I want to build this using era-appropriate techniques. Wire wrap sockets are a little tough to find for me, so I thought, you know what? I like soldering. Soldering's fun. I'll just do point-to-point -point wiring, solder everything down. That's more durable, and if I'm um, pulling things in and out, I'm not going to jostle a wire loose or anything like that. Plus, you can pack the boards tighter. 
Um, but per board, no, no pre-etched boards or anything like that. Just testing and building and modifying as I go. And before I actually got to any serious circuitry, I thought to myself, I think I know what my front panel should look like. I have an idea of what this all this layout should should be. Um, data switches and address switches. I want to be able to hop to every single address. Because um, looking at the 1802, you can't hop to specific addresses. I, I want to be able to do that. That looks like fun. Um, and I, I, I scored these momentary switches. I thought those would be fun little little data switches, but uh, how am I going to make that work? That'll, uh, we'll go to that in a minute. Um, but the ability to, to reset and run and hopefully maybe even step, but we'll cross that bridge in a minute. Um, protect RAM, examine, deposit, examine next, deposit next. You know, some complex operations there. I want to see what that's all about. Oh, and a turnkey. Turnkey is very important. Um, it's not necessary, but it's fun. And I'm looking at the, the 6502, and I'm realizing, man, I've seen a lot of other processors that have like a way to, to bus enable to turn stuff off. And oh man, I'm going to have to use a lot of tri-state buffers to, to make the CPU sit quiet, because it's not going to help me do DMA. And 1802 will help you do DMA. It's going to help you step through. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it's, it's automatically doing your, in, your incrementing for you and your, your latching so you can push stuff into memory. It, it's assisting you. This doesn't have any such features. Nobody thought to. They took that stuff out. That was kind of intentional. They want it as lean and mean and fast as possible, no fluff. Um, now, I, I don't have a, a super strong understanding of the way an 8800 or, uh, or an IMSI um, will do it, but it, it's basically just pushing the CPU off in, in the corner, kind of. and. It's a relatively minimal front panel uh, otherwise. Um, the, the circuitry is not super complicated after that. I'm, talk to somebody who knows that type of system better than I do. But then I've come across this guy here. Western Design Center's CMOS version of the 6502. It's got a static core. People are telling me, listen, you, you can't do uh, single stepping with the 6502. You can't halt and resume because it's going to lose its contents of memory. It's got a, you know, that DRAM inside for its registers. It's going to forget what it's doing partway through. You need a way to, to keep it refreshed on that. Well, the static core solves that problem. Uh, and look, the pinout's nearly identical. And they're still making them even better. I can get fresh ones if I accidentally fry one. Um, haven't done that yet, but still. What's most important here is we've got a bus enable pin. We can tell the, uh, the address and data buses and even the rewrite line you be quiet now. It's not your turn. With one pin, we don't need all this extra logic. That's great. And so I start working on actually wiring up the front panel. And the next thing I know, I've got um, 72 individual lines running on ribbon cables. This stuff smells terrible. It came on this massive spool. And while I, don't rem uh, while I wasn't around for the 70s, I, I assume this is what would, uh, the 70s smelled like. It's this kind of phenolithic. Um, plastic funk that um, it smells like it died in the back of an overheating van. It, it's nasty. So I have to keep it outside for like six months to outgas. Um, but it gets the job done and doesn't smell like that anymore. And I'm wiring and I'm wiring and realizing I should probably still start building interface cards for this. Um, one thing as I'm building, I realized I don't want to use a piece of kit that's more powerful than the 6502. I see a lot of folks when they, they homebrew a machine, they say to themselves, well, we'll just take the 6502 and we'll bolt it to a PIC or an Atmel or some other high power modern microcontroller that can do a lot of the heavy lifting for me so I don't have to do glue logic, I don't have to do a lot of extra storage. I'm sorry, I, I feel like that's cheating if I'm trying to experience the 70s. I, I don't need that. So we're going to do it all from scratch. No Homestar Runner fans? OK, cool. Um, but I'm also cheating in one other aspect. There, there are some things I think are kosher, and that is I don't want to do a ton of RAM. It's the 70s you're doing DRAM, lots and lots and lots of boards of DRAM. You look inside of most Altair 8800s, it's like, what, 60% RAM, sometimes a little more. It's, it's a lot of boards just for DRAM. It's not very dense. Or you can go static RAM, but again, at the time, it wouldn't have been super uh, uh, tightly packed. OK, fine, I'll, I'll cheat on that, because I just don't want to do tons and tons of the same tedious thing over and over again. I say that as I'm you know, talking about a front panel machine. But, um, and so I start getting into the actual logic of how things are going. 
I want to be able to move through my address space cleanly. I want to be able to not just set an address and visit it, I want to be able to count through it. So I create the address card here, a bunch of, um, uh, what are these, 74, 193 counters, so I can cascade their, their counting, I can count up and down, but I can preload. I can set the switches and go to something and see what's going on. Um, and then when it came to the data stuff, entering in data bits, I was like, you know, I've got these momentary switches. I want like a flip-flop. I want to be able to set a bit or clear a bit. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and I wasn't sure if something was like that was possible or had been done before, but it was like, that, that, seems, that seems like a good way to go. And I'm starting to test and whatnot. Um, and then last year, I'm here. And Mike Lone has his HP 1000, and he's sitting people down and saying, here, try toggling in some stuff. And I'm sitting there like, wait a minute. There are no latching switches? They're, they don't lock? They're push buttons. This has been done before? <gasps> OK, my idea is not so crazy. And if they did it, I can do it. If they did it in the 70s, I can do it now. And that's at what it ends up actually looking like to make that happen. The top row is just a pair of um, double flip flops that have preset and clear. and. Um, and then the rest is all buffers to make sure that these flip-flops can, can load the contents of the data bus at the right time and dump it back out to the data bus at the other right time when you're actually doing a write to, to memory of some kind. And the result is you, get, you can set your address. You can play with the bits uh, of data at that address. That's nice. Those big old paddles, though, I love them so much. Um, and I was really happy to, to find out that the CNK uh, uh, with the, the J4 or J5 paddle, you know, that's what I got my hands on. I bought the entire stockpile out from uh, Electronic Gold Mine, all 19 switches. I asked for 30, and they said, "Sorry, dude, we only have 19." I'm like, "I'll take them anyway. I don't care. Just ship them now." Uh, I'm, I'm told they're very hard to get your hands on, especially the momentary ones. Um, come back to that in a second here. Um, Actually, no, we won't. Turns out that uh, NKK just so happens to make something pretty darn close. It's a little crunchier, um, but it seems to do a pretty nice job. The other ones that I was using, uh, they were nasty little locking switches for the, the address ones. But again, I'm, I'm springing for NKKs for the next revision. The first one's just made out of found parts, so you know that's what I, I had access to. But that turnkey, that's important. Again, you got to be able to, to walk away from your computer with your keys, and somebody can't walk over there and turn it on. Obviously, if you got a paper clip, you're good. You can turn it back on. But um, <laughs> oh, great! I said that out loud, didn't I? And the result ends up being this, you know, this stack of cards. But more importantly, we have to orchestrate what's going on between those data control card and the address control card. We need a way to sequence these operations so we don't have to press a ton of switches to load a value or to check a value or to see the next one. Um, whoops, I went too far. Um, so these four here, these packed tight ones, data control, address, con sorry, address control, data control, and then behind a, uh, a status control to keep an eye on what's going on uh, and more importantly to tell uh, the right sequence of events to happen in, in the correct order. Because first things first, if we want to examine an address, we got to first go to whatever that may be. If we're first doing an increment, we're jumping to whatever the switches say. And then after that, we're loading whatever's at those switches. We got to make sure that that's timed correctly. So we got this chain of D latches with this 555 timer, and away it goes. It's, it's actually pretty um, human time scale and how fast it goes through it. So you can watch it step through when it's it's being a little finicky. Um, but on top of that, we need to, if we're loading a value, we need to be able to clear out whatever's in those flip-flops first so that the old value and the new value don't step on each other. That's important. Um, but if we're doing a deposit next, really complex operation, that's four different things. First, we're doing a deposit, and then we're doing an increment address, and then we're doing a, um, a clear the, the, the buffers, and then we're doing a, a load the buffer. You know, That's a lot going on. Um, now, on that, uh, the MSI and the Altair, a lot of people like to play kill the bit. That means that they have software addressable inputs. And as I'm building stuff, I think to myself, no, no, I want to be able to lock down that front panel the second I turn on that CPU. I don't want somebody to accidentally step on whatever the CPU is doing. You know, if I'm running basic, I don't want to accidentally press a switch and then all of a sudden, oh, well, I lost what I was doing. There goes 
<sighs> there goes a 100 line program, now I gotta do it all over again. So I put in all these lockouts to prevent you from, from touching anything. And then the 6522 VIA shows up and I think to myself, you know, I bet you I could wire that up to my data switches when I'm running and read and see what's going on in the software. I can check what values those, those see. That's nice. And I can do out, output on some LEDs too, software addressable. Um, but going back to being able to use BASIC, we've got to talk it, uh, to it over serial. We've got the uh, uh, Motorola 6850. Um, we can switch our, our baud rate with a jumper switch. All right, we can, we can do some serious work here. We're, we're not just limited to the front panel. We can do a higher level language, and that's nice. But I don't want to switch my baud rate by hand. This is a pain. And then somebody shows me the 6551 and says, oh, you know, you set that in software. I'm like, really? It just I can change my baud rate on the fly? You certainly can. In fact, it's not nearly as dense in terms of support circuitry. We can fit two of them on there. All right, we got serious serial interaction. All right, I've been ignoring the single step problem until now. So this right here is from a uh, design uh, by MOS technology, they, this is their suggestion for how to do single stepping and sing, or single cycle and single instruction. That is a nightmare. That is a lot of gates. I can find no examples of somebody actually building one of these and using one with a 6502. But it means somebody was thinking about single stepping it, despite the fact that they were still on DRAM cores. And then I come across this circuit um, by a guy by the name of uh, Thrashbarg from about 15 years ago. I'm just digging around the internet, and he goes, yeah, I was trying this to do single stepping. And I'm like, OK, so somebody else has thought about it. Everybody else is telling me I'm crazy and I shouldn't even try. But that means somebody else has thought about it. Maybe I'm not the only crazy one out there. Then uh, Apple One fans might recognize this one. This is, uh, this is Waz's design for debug purposes. This is his single step little circuit there. OK, interesting. Single cycle as well. But again, he's probably going to have that same problem. I can't find any ex um, examples of that previous one existing either. And I look at it, and I go to, um, you know, I, I talk to Thrashbarg about it, and he goes, yeah, my original circuit's terrible. Here, try this. And he just scribbles something out and sends it to me. Oh, OK. That looks pretty reasonable. I think I can give that a try. And I did some tests, and the next thing I know, uh, it doesn't work. Probably doing something wrong, but I said, you know what? Let me just try it my way. Something really, really stupid simple. As in taking me the clock and saying, OK, I'm going to just pulse the clock with a, with a key press. That'll be my clock. One or the other will select you know, back and forth. That'll be fine. But then we also have to tell, um, due to the interlocking, we've got, we've got this front panel. We've got the 6502. And they have to share that bus. But the 6502 is not going to help you with that DMA. That means we have to tell it to go sit quiet in the corner with that, that bus enable pin. That means that the front panel takes over. But the second we do that single step, we want to briefly relinquish uh, the, the bus control from, from the front panel and let the 6502 tell us what's going on super quick and talk to all its devices. And then we'll really, you know, go right back to the front panel. So you got to be able to switch back and forth there. And that took a little while. And the result is this massive pile of cards. Um, let's see, debug in the top right, the next to that status control, data control, address control. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, parallel interface, serial interface, uh, old version, RAM. We got 32K of static RAM. That's nice. We don't have to deal with all that DRAM and, and uh, tons and tons of little SRAM chips. Things are nice. Um, and a lot of people are like, you know, it's the 70s. You should probably see what core is all about. I'm like, yeah, you're right. If I'm exploring that era, well, core is hard to get my hands on. Let's try just modern NVRAM for the moment. It'll ex simulate the same experience. It's tinier, but 2K of battery back to NVRAM. Right now, that's the only permanent storage that's on there. That's pretty terrible. We'll get to what's coming down the line, though. Um, then the CPU card, and then uh, being able to swap out our, our EEPROMs. We can go between basic and other pre-written assembly stuff. And then our modern dual serial card. And then this guy's a little different here. This is an NMOS card for NMOS 6502s. If you want to drop in a real deal one, you've got those extra buffers on there. That's nice. But uh, it does one other little party trick. 
Um, there's a couple of little tiny boards over here. One for a standard one megahertz MOS 6502 from Commodore, or MOS technology. And then this guy, which drops the clock down to 50 kilohertz. Anybody know what runs at 50 kilohertz that's not technically a real 6502? Anyone? The Atari 2600, I believe. Um, I was going to go with processors, but um, I, I actually don't know how fast that one runs. All right, any of you all heard of the Monster 6502? The giant broken out version? That happens to go at about a 50 kilohertz speed. That's as fast as it'll travel. Why? Capacitance and inductance kind of build up, and you, you just can't go any faster. Things get clobbered. And I talked to Eric Schlaefer, the guy who created it, and he goes, yeah, we can connect those up. And I was like, wait, you're serious? OK, sure. So VCF uh, West out in California about a month ago, we connected them up. And after a little while, we actually got them talking. And the cactus will run even something that slow. Third machine, by the way, that will run the Monster 6502. The other two are ones that he created as debug devices. But there's a whole ton of cards. And there's even one that's actually out at my table that's uh, not in this photo. It's a sound card that I built within the last week to use the SAA 1099, because I really like the way the creative music system sounds. And I'm like, yeah, OK, it's a little later than other stuff. But it's buzzy. It sounds square waves. I love it. I love it. And the result is a full computer. We can run BASIC. We can enter stuff in the front panel. We can talk to it. And it's all because we can tell the 6502, you be quiet, it's my turn. But that means that like half the machine is just for front panel interaction. That's insane. That's a lot of machine. And that's even with optimizations. I mean, there's still more to do. But we're doing that in about 25 chips. And then you go look at the Altair 800. And actually, yeah, that front panel interface is about 25 chips. OK, maybe I'm not doing so bad. Then you look at the 1802 guys, and they're like, we barely have any chips to run our front panel. I'm like, mm -hmm. um, so let's go back to those those fun status control switches. We can reset our CPU. We can run and halt. Let the CPU either take over or the front panel take over, depending on which one it is. Stepping the processor when the, the CPU is halted, just to send it those individual clock pulses. Protect memory, and this I swear every time I say I'll fix it, I never do. Um, then after that, the fun ones. Examine, examine next, deposit, deposit next. The idea is you can go through super fast and just entering tons and tons of data. All right, byte, deposit next, byte, deposit next, byte, deposit next. And it saves you a lot of time. Um, MSI and Altair guys, I'm told that this is backwards for you. I'm told it's actually a next deposit. Um, but there's no way. It, it, when it comes to entering in fresh bytes on those, you have to set all eight switches, right? It doesn't matter if you only have one bit out of place. You've got to set all eight of your switches to overwrite that new one. I mean, obviously, if it's right, you just you know examine next past it. But still, that's that's nice to be able to um, deposit some value and then see whatever came directly after it, so you can go, yeah, do I need to modify that? Sure, I I can if I have to. Um, oh yeah, that's the thing driving our our sequencing here. Um, it's a it's a nightmare. It's all point to point wiring, so most of it's a rat's nest to follow. Um, Surprise! It runs sometimes. Oh, we already saw that one and that one. So a couple of takeaways here: front panels are incredibly tedious, especially to build. But uh, you know, you get a lot of control. You can hop in and see individual bytes, and you don't have to rely on a program running sometimes to see what's going on. Obviously, if you have a CGRS Microtech and a Sim 1, that's going to, you know, you're still running a program. But this, we don't need any of that. We can just turn on the machine and start playing with, with bytes and data and program. Uh, wiring a front panel from the ground up is incredibly time consuming. And um, I've been at this for uh, almost a year and a half. Serious build time has been about a year. But it, it takes, you know, it takes some time. Blinking lights, though. It makes it all worth it. It really does. Being able to watch the 6502 as it's working and doing fetches and loads and observing what address it's at at any given time and what's going on, that's a lot of fun. Everybody else gets that. Now the 6502 gets that. Um, but I've got a, a kind of a, a little what if that I, I've been thinking about the past couple of days. Um, so now we did it back in the day. 
because it wasn't easy to do this, uh, this cheaply since you had to build so much extra circuitry to support a front panel for a 6502. But what if, what if somebody combined that same kind of a, a smaller footprint like what the Elf guys did? I think there's something there potentially. You know, obviously a little more minimalist, more heavy user load work, but I don't know. This is just something I've been thinking about. Talk to me later if you're curious because I think that's possible. I got to give some thanks to a lot of folks who have helped me along the way here. Um, either encouragement or technical help or historical info or just, hey, tell me about your thing. And they act as a rubber duck as I figure out what's going on. Um, I want to say thank you to a lot of those folks. In fact, there's a couple of folks here right now. Hey, DJ, you're on that list. Um, but th this has been a, a long time coming, filling in this, this uh, this what if, you know, because I've been thinking about this since 2015 when I first saw that OSI 300 and it all clicked as, wait, this has been done before, but it hasn't been done before. Where's the missing link? Well, it's here now. Um, I realize this has gotten a little jumbled, uh, so I'm going to move on to questions and not take up too much more of your time. If, any questions, any curiosities, anything you want to know more about? Anything I need to clarify? When am I going to make a kit? I'm working on it, I swear. Uh, I've got like 25 people asking now, something like that, so OK. Crazy idea. Sure. Have you thought about having blinking lights for the internal processor status bits, like the negative flag, carry flag, and all that, maybe triggered by RFUs? I, I have thought about that briefly, but I haven't, not enough to, to figure out a good way to do it, because um, it is, it is a useful thing to have, but I, I haven't honestly explored it all that much. It, it'd be fun, and I'd like to add more blinking lights on there. I mean, I've got a way to add another 16 just right to the front panel uh, right now, but uh, that first one, that, that you've seen the wood that it's made out of. That's kind of the first run. There's no labeling on the address um, lights to know which one's the least significant and most significant bit, because I was still deciding on what numbering scheme I wanted to go with. Do I want to use letters for the higher stuff once we get above uh, 9 or not? And then uh, the place I was using a laser cutter at just closed down, and so I lost access to it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Now I can't make Rev 2. I guess i got to work with what i got here. And I don't feel like putting stickers on there because that's just, I don't know, I don't think it would go well with the rest of the, the, the style. Um, yes, I would like to, to add those, and I, we need to talk later about that because I think you have some ideas about it that are probably better than what I have. Any other questions? Any other comments? Curiosities? Cool. All right, so if you have them in the next you know, couple hours here while we're still here, stop by, see the cactus. We'll talk about it. If you want to try it, play with it, run basic, front panel, whatever, be my guest. Um, if you want to tell me I'm doing a terrible job and uh, you know, correct me on some of my slides here, feel free. Um, yeah, thank you for coming.